What's going on? Thanks for checking in. Have the GOAT Sierra Romero to my right here. And we have the next up and comer, Skylar Wallace to my left. SEC Player of the Year. She's in the top three for NCAA Collegiate Player of the Year, which they're announcing this weekend. So Skylar today is gonna show her some hitting drills or a hitting routine that led to her success this past year, hitting 450 with 20 jacks. So this is one you're not gonna wanna miss if you're a softballer. Make sure you stay tuned, check this one out. All right, so what's the first drill you have for us? Okay, so the first drill I have is the flamingo drill. So okay. I start with my feet together and kind of just work my hands, say middle of the field. I like to do this drill first just to really warm up my body and loosen everything up and fill things out for the day, so. Do you feel like this one gets your lower half? Like mm -hmm. engaged and working? I think this one's really important for me because it allows my hands and my bottom half to sync up. So if they're moving together, then I'm in a good place and this kind of loosens it all up, gets it going, and it goes from there. Okay. I feel like one thing that's important to note on this drill is that when you're doing this flamingo drill, you could easily land and be all the way over on your front side, mm -hmm. but you're not. Like notice that when you're watching this video, she stacks. So when she lands on her right leg, she's still having resistance pushing her back. She's not just letting everything like be lost and pushed forward. So it's nice, even, and just power through the ball. Yeah. Those are all, I mean, and notice too, she's, she's doing this, she's staying stacked in her legs, but she's consistently creating that backspin. Mm -hmm. So like, even though this ball's not moving, she's still swinging with the purpose, right? She's not just swinging and rolling over, or if she did roll over, I guarantee you the next one would be fixed. Yep. So that's a big thing off of T is making sure that if you do mess up or something's bad, it's an immediate fix because that ball's not moving. So yep. you should be able to make a quick adjustment. Going off that too, I like to aim for the top of the cage when hitting um, and really focusing on like the middle bottom half of the ball. So not directly middle, not directly bottom, but that middle half and kind of trying to spin it this way. Yeah, that nice back spin That's spin. the back spin. If spin. anything yep. top spin, you'll see your ball like drooping down. Yep. And you don't want that. You want to see the flight continuing to take off. Mm -hmm. I'll do one more. Nice. All right, what's the next drill you have for him? Okay, so the next drill, going to a wider stance. And I'm gonna start with my bat head, my bat knob facing the pitcher. From here, you kinda just load back, swing through the ball. On this drill, I really like to focus on staying middle. I like to use this white line as my reference of keeping my bat on that white line going all the way up the middle of the field. And then just to clarify too, cause you don't normally swing that way, obviously. Nope. So the focus there is to keep your hands tight and mm -hmm. inside. Yep. But that's not how you're actually swinging. Right. That was a bad one. Obviously, it didn't stay on my line. So now her adjustment will be to stay on the line. Better. And this one I'm not perfect at. It's just really filling out my hands and my swing going together. I feel like a, a good thing there is like, look at the first couple, right? They weren't what she wanted. Were they probably base hits? Yeah. So in a game, nobody's going to care because it's a base hit. But here off the tee in practice, we're trying to be as close to perfect as we can, mm -hmm. even though that's not actually going to happen. Softball's obviously a game full of failure. But I think at the end of the day, the important thing to note on that drill is, one, it's a weird drill because that's not how she actually starts her swing but there's always adjustments to be made. So as you're watching that one, look at the first few, notice what she did wrong by maybe coming out and around the ball, but then notice how she fixed, fixed it to get the line drives middle and then opposite field. There it is again. I'm waiting for Summers to sit here saying, Randy. <laughs> there you go. Let's do one more. Why do you feel like 
I mean, I know why I love staying inside the ball, but like, what what's the big thing for you? Like, why do you like it? Why do you think it helps you have so much success? I think it puts my bat path in a good position, um, and it allows me to stay long through the zone. It doesn't allow me to pull off a ball or be too late on it. If I can stay inside the ball, I'm hitting it in a good contact spot. And I'm curious if you think this too, but like I feel like with you staying long through the zone, like it allows for more mistakes mm -hmm. in your swing or for you to make mistakes with whatever pitch you're swinging yep. at. Yep. Like, it, yeah, so I think a big thing too, like with staying inside the ball, because I know I preach it mm -hmm. like, like crazy. Yeah. I just feel like I could be fooled on a changeup. I could be fooled on any pitch or just really not know what's about to come at me. But if I'm keeping my hands inside, I can kind of put the ball wherever I need to. Yep. I can almost you manipulate can kind of it. handle everything. Yeah. You're not going to be perfect at all of them, but you can kind of have a, a feel for all pitches. Sweet. So what's the next one? So that's all I do really for T work, for T drills. Um, after that, I'll kind of just move the T around, do like an outside, do an inside, make sure I'm filling that all out, and then a lot of front toss. Lot that's of front what I toss. like to see. Um, I'm a visual, like I said earlier to Sierra, but I'm a big visual, so if I can see what my ball is looking like on front toss and get my timing up with that, then that's usually what sets me up for a live. Sweet. So let's go ahead and go do front toss. All right. So we're going to do front toss. Mm -hmm. So what is your focus and the main thing that you really try to do? Yeah. So for the first few reps and stuff, I'm just kind of get a feel of uh, timing up, syncing up, all of that good stuff, feeling out my, my ball flight, um, and then really adjusting from there. So if I'm seeing a lot of hooks or right side of the field, I'm going to try to stay inside the ball more and hit towards where it says rewards over there or like shortstop area. Um, if not, I'm trying to stay middle and just left center. That's where a lot of my power and my bat, uh, bat path goes. So doing that in live and or front toss here and translates to live. So really just trying to focus on that and go from there. Sweet. And he throws me an inside pitch. <laughs> Let me warm it up here. Oh. And then as you're hitting front toss, could you talk a little bit about, you mentioned like that box yeah. that you've kind of created in your head when you're hitting. Yep. Can you tell them a little bit about it and kind of what you're doing when yeah. you're visualizing that? So it's actually kind of funny. Uh, if any of y'all have played Wii, I know that's kind of like an older thing now, but there's like a blue screen right here and it's a little square um, and it shows like the pitches in baseball that are coming through so like it has like the drop coming in have the rise and I just think about seeing that all the way through my box and my box is where I want to make contact with the ball so usually it's about right there middle of the plate or so um, and that's where I think of my box trying to see the ball the pitch through that zone if it's not there obviously taking the pitch um, if it's there trying to mash it is that that's helping you with your strike zone too, like yes. knowing ball versus strike. Yep. Obviously, you're looking at where to make contact, but I feel like you and I talked about that a little bit earlier too, like how important it is mm -hmm. to know your strike zone. Mm -hmm. Everyone's is different. Yep. You're much taller than me. Like your strike zone is going to be a little bit different than mine right. with where I'm looking. So right. like knowing it and owning it, I feel like is really important mm -hmm. as a hitter. Yeah, and I think learning your strike zone and what you're good at. So like obviously my strike zone is not going to be down here because a drop ball or a down pitch is not my my favorite or my strength. So it's usually, usually a little bit up, and that's where I'm trying to go. So being in more reps in, figuring out what you're good at, figuring out what you're not good at, that's going to set you up for a strike zone in that, that square that I talk about. Right. And that's a visual that you've kind of just come, come up yeah. with in your head. Like, yep. this is what's going to help me. Yep. Okay. Ooh. A little too much backspin. I just don't know why I keep pulling it. My timing's a little early. There we go. Quick thing I want to share. So a lot of my balls were being pulled to the right side. Um, my swing, I didn't feel bad, so I'm thinking it was my timing. So on that, I was just trying to make an adjustment to really hit right toward that rack or right back to his face. So in that zone is where I was trying to go with the ball, just to try to make an adjustment and hit it more middle or left center. And then when it comes to like your hitting approach, 
obviously I know you have like the box visual, you do all that stuff, like you're big on mm -hmm. visual learning in general. Yep. So what do you do, like let's say in game, because obviously you try to make the practice like the game, but front toss is gonna be a little bit different, uh -huh. so is machine. So like when you get into the box, I know you probably watch film, but what mental approach do you have for every single pitcher? Like what's something that does not change no matter what? Yeah, um, my mental approach is I can't be beat. So I'm better and my work has been put in. So I know I'm confident, go in there and know that she's not gonna beat me even with her best stuff. She might every once in a while and I think that's part of the game, that mm -hmm. is what it is. But you're zero for zero the next at bat and she's not beating you that at bat. So I just always tell myself that I can't be beat. So with that mindset, I would imagine that the only way that that confidence happens is in your preparation yes, and absolutely. what you're doing before the game. Absolutely. So like if you're not hitting and you're obviously going to feel crappy before mm -hmm. the game and then you probably won't feel super confident yep. in your ability. Putting all that work in the week up or even the month up to the games, whatever the situation might be. Um, if I haven't put the work in, I'm obviously not going to be as confident, but it's also been reps after reps after reps I've taken to have that confidence instilled that I know that she's not yeah. gonna beat me. So like important thing to know is like, that's not something she just developed randomly. Yeah. Like that confident happens over time. Yep. It'd be nice if confidence was just like, boom, here you go. It would be and really nice. Like, Dang, I'm good, <laughs> I'm, I'm the best out there. Yeah. But unfortunately, like it does come with a lot of work, a lot of preparation uh -huh. and consistent, right? Yep. You're, you're consistently putting in that work and it's the only way you feel confident yep. in, in performing when it matters. Absolutely. Oof. You could keep swinging, Skylar. I was just going to mention a couple of things on these next two swings you take. So as you're swinging, I just want to point something out for them to pay attention to. So obviously when she's doing her front toss reps, like she's taking good aggressive swings, she's working on her visual, her approach, everything is staying the same. But one thing to note, which I'm sure is part of her preparation in the beginning, which was that flamingo drill of driving with her legs. Every single swing she takes right now, a front toss, she's driving her back leg really hard. Like it, there's no, you know, moment of her just kind of pushing through the ball and taking like a super relaxed swing every single time. So obviously I'm a righty, so it's my right leg, her left. Her back leg is driving really hard as if she's trying to literally break through that softball mm -hmm. rather than just kind of staying back here and spinning off or like going and just pushing through the ball. Because then if she lands like that and she's stacked and she's driving that back leg down this way, she could get anything away. She could get a chain. She could get any pitch and she'll still be able to adjust mm -hmm. even if she's fooled. That's the big thing in softball. The pitcher already has the upper hand. They know what they're going to throw to you. Right. You have no idea. So it's how can you adjust when you're wrong? Because unfortunately, there's a lot of times you're going to be wrong or you're going to guess wrong or sit wrong in, the, in a bad moment. And so it's like, okay, how do I get myself out of it? Whether it's fouling it off or two-strike approach and still getting the ball mm -hmm. to drop, right, or get past the infielder. So with her, her legs being the way that they are, when you guys are watching her hit front toss, like notice that because every single time it's the same. There's not one specifically where she's just kind of like relaxed because then that creates those bad reps mm -hmm. that we don't want. So every single time her legs are stacked and she's driving through the ball. So just watch maybe two more. Should have hit that one. That was my pitch. Yeah. A big thing in baseball is sitting pitches. Um, so, like, if we have, say, a guy's out there facing Clayton Kershaw, he's got the big curveball, mm -hmm. right? So, a lot of the time, guys will just sit dead red. Hey, I'm sitting on that curveball because I'm guaranteed to get at that at bat. Yeah. That's a big thing at all levels, yep. you know, especially with a guy out there throwing 95 miles an hour. You're facing girls at the elite level throwing that hard as well. Do you go into an approach at an AB, like sitting different pitches, or do you sit fastball, react off speed? Like, what do you typically do? Yeah, so I think it goes to watching film and seeing what their, their strengths are and what they're consistently throwing to every, every batter. So obviously I'm looking more to the left, uh, lefties that they're facing before me and seeing how they're uh, pitching them and say, so maybe she's a really big screwball pitcher. I know that she's going to throw the screwball in a lot of counts, a lot of good counts, and try to use that to get ahead of me. So first of all, feel things out. And after that, seeing how she's working me and then adjusting from there. 
But I think it's really important to have your film and see what they're kind of throwing to batters before you. Yeah, you said that too, Sierra. That was a big thing you did was watch film. Yeah, I think the film is a big part of it, and it really just depends on, like, the pitcher. Like, I, I love hitting off speed. Mm -hmm. So if there was a pitcher that threw a lot of off speed, I wasn't really worried about watching that right. film because I knew I was going to be in a good position to hit it. It's more, let's say, if she throws a really good rise ball that she could throw for a ball and a strike, then my preparation during the week is hitting the rise ball that's a strike but letting go of the rise right. ball that's ball because that's her pitch to, like, make you bite and jump, and then she throws it for a strike and tries to freeze mm -hmm. you because you think it's about to jump out of the zone. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's always that prep of it. It depends on the pitcher, what she pitches. Um, but, like, for me, typically, I, I don't really sit very many pitches. There are certain counts where I sit a pitch, but I'm never going really into an at-bat sitting a specific pitch. Yeah. I'm sitting a strike. Yep. If it's a strike, I'm swinging because I like to simplify it that way because I know I can hit – drop, curve, rise, change. Like, I'm like, I'm not, yeah. I'm like, I can hit whatever she's throwing. Like, to me, again, right. I'm better than her. So, yeah. like, mm -hmm. whatever she's throwing, my swing is better than whatever her pitch is. So, I feel prepared in that sense. But really, there's just certain counts. Because there's a count where there, I might be like, oh, she would love to throw a change up in this count. Right. So, then I'm bought in, as long as I don't have two strikes, I'm like, I'm sitting a change up right here. And if she throws this change up, it's going over the fence. I agree. So, it's really depending on the count more so than actually sitting that pitch the entire at bat. Okay. Um, but really, I'm sitting a strike because I know I can hit any pitch. And adjusting from there, yeah. Yeah. So what about zones? Like, so you picture your box, right? Mm -hmm. Do you ever, like, cut the plate in half, think in, think out? Like, do you ever think that way or no? Just no. Kind of Kinda just fill things out from the, the get-go and how things are working and then re adjust from there. Now, do you... I trust my swing enough to know that if she throws it outside, I can hit the outside and I can adjust to the inside as well. Yeah. So it's a lot of hitters too, and I, whether she realizes she's doing it or not, but a lot of hitters without realizing it, you're actually typically always sitting away and adjusting, and adjusting in. Yeah. So it's like, because then what happens is like if you're sitting away and you're ready for that away pitch, it's like you're already sit and you're waiting to let that ball get deep. And if you recognize it's in and you just adjust, all that is is just boom, boom. pulling your hands yep, there. More if you sit in – it's hard to adjust away because mm -hmm. if you're sitting in, you have to get there earlier, and then all of a sudden it's outside pitch, like you're not going to hit that right. ball well because it's hard to go from sitting inside to, oh, shoot, now it's butt out. I'm reaching for the outside pitch. So a lot of times hitters don't realize they're doing it, but they're actually usually ready for the away, and then if it comes in, they're fighting it off, or they are trying to swing at it. It yeah. just depends because some girls like hitting. In some don't like it. It really is like a preference of what's your strengths mm -hmm. and weaknesses. Because like if you think about it too, like you're if you're looking for that pitch away, like okay away. Oh I no, it's not coming in. I just yeah. at that point it's a reaction. I guess at, now that you say that, a lot of people do sit out and mm -hmm. adjust it. In. Yeah, it's do really you, hard do you know to how sit. How many strikeouts in. you had this year? <laughs> All right, check this out. This is crazy. Skyler this year only had 20 strikeouts the entire year. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sierra and her career. Had 60 strikeouts. Your junior year, you have only had eight strikeouts in 180 at bats. So you guys know a thing or two about hitting with two strikes. I know Sierra makes an adjustment. You could talk about it a little bit. But what is your adjustment when you get down two strikes? Do you change anything with your swing, toe tap, heel lift? All stays the same? Anything Wait. mental? Just stays pretty much the same. Um, I sometimes it's a bad habit, but I'll move. I'll make the plate a little bit bigger just because I know the ball that's pretty close over the plate. You have to hit that. Um, but I still stay with the same approach, same same mindset, same swing. Don't change anything up. I really developed this more so um, in the pro level, but in the college level, I still had a two strike approach. It was just to get to my um, toe touch sooner. So. In my normal swing, I would start open, and it was all one motion. So every single time it was getting there, yeah, my toe still got down sooner. But when I got to two strikes, once her arm went back, I was here. So I was already in my set position, but weight was back. And the reason why I did that was because I allowed myself all the way until I was at two strikes to get my swing off. Mm -hmm. But then once I was at two strikes, like I knew that I didn't have to – it's not that I didn't have to – I knew that I wasn't going to strike out. Like I knew that I could catch any – ball with my bat like mm -hmm. that was how I simplified it just try to touch the ball with your bat and if I can do that I'm fouling it off or I'm putting it in play so I feel like that's why I had so little strikeouts because even if I was getting out I was still putting the ball in play, play and forcing right. them to make make me out like mm -hmm. get me out 
Um, but then as I got older and I started facing some of the more elite pitchers consistently, like some of those pro pitchers, I actually changed my um, two strike approach from instead of getting to my stride earlier, I opened up my stance and I took away my stride. And the reason I did that is because in the pro league, the strike zone is much bigger. And so for me, I wanted to just sit still and be able to reach. I basically in the pro league, I need to be able to hit chalk to chalk. That sucks as a hitter because that's not a strike. However, I will say it gets called. So because of that, I need to know that if I just widen up my stance a little bit, it's almost like I'm playing pepper. Yep. However, my pepper, just like her pepper, can still go over the fence. Like I know that even in this two strike approach, I still can hit the ball over the fence. So for me, that's not limiting my swing at all because I can still, I've done it before. I'll hit front toss, I'll hit live, and I can still take one yard. So for me, the only way I wouldn't do that two strike approach is if it's taking away from my swing, which is why everyone needs to develop their own. Because if I was hitting the ball, you know, crappy and I couldn't get it past the infield, I would not approach it in that way. But I still have success and power with that approach. So that's why I keep it with the no stride now, just because of the, the wider strike zone. If the strike zone wasn't so expanded in the pro league, I would probably just keep my get to toe touch early. However, it is rather big side to side and up and down. Mm -hmm. um, so because I don't really know what the strike zone is all the time, I just know that I have to be able to fight things off or make do with whatever I'm getting. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the same thing in college a yeah. little bit. Yeah, like you really don't know. Really big strike zones, so. And then that's the other thing. If you face an umpire that doesn't really know who his or her strike zone is, you're adjusting. And so it's like you have to have some type of yep. approach when you are down two strikes. Yep. I never knew that stat. That's insane. That's wild. I, that's I so didn't know legit. that. You had eight strikeouts. 27, 14, eight. Like, you were on something different. That was, and that was my junior year. I didn't even win player of the year that year. Ways. Another big thing that stands out looking at you is freshman year, was it? Mm -hmm. You only hit eight home runs. Mm -hmm. And then this past year, you hit 20. Yep. So what was that adjustment? Was it like, hey, I'm just going to try to start lifting the ball, try to start swinging harder? Even you, Sierra, too, you know, you hit 80-something. How many home runs did you hit, career? I don't know. It was like 86 or something. Close to 100 homers, <laughs> which is nuts. Is that something you guys are actively trying to do? Because in the softball world, looking at lefties, what do they try to teach you to do first thing? Just slap. Right. How did you stray away from that? And how did you realize, hey, I got some real power here. How do, how do I start tapping into it? Uh, yeah, I moved to the left-hand side when I was about 12, 10, 12, I want to say. Um, I was still doing right and left. Found out that I was better uh, at seeing the ball on the left-hand side. Um, then you, not a lot of people are moving over, so I was trying to slap, bunt, hit. But I had the power naturally from just genetics, honestly, and um, my body type. So got that, went to the left side, and then really found out that I was not a slapper. I mean, I had a lot of power, so why you know, not generate more power and use that to my uh, advantage? Started hitting on consistently on the left side, let power work in. But the main thing that I would say from my freshman year to now is really just being consistent. I, I don't think my swing changed much. I think it's just mentality and being consistent and putting the work in. I think that's really the only difference. I mean, last year I was still working, but those off days I was taking off. And I was, you know, like letting my body rest, not knowing. Just as that this year, even if I went in and watched film maybe on the off day and just did 20 reps off a tee, I was still doing something for my swing and staying in rhythm with everything. 1% better every day. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's what it is at the end of the day. It's being consistent. Consistency is key. I mean, and, and, and that's what's crazy is sometimes people think like, you know, I have to go train for five hours. Like, no, if you get your work done and you get what you need to do done in 45 minutes to an hour, mm -hmm. like you're done. Like, that's one thing that, like, my sister and I, like, Sid and I were notorious for in travel ball because you'd have the girls, like, you'd have Mike Stith, he'd be like, okay, let's go hit for two hours. Sid and I are like, we're done in an hour. But yeah. he would sometimes not understand that, but then he realized how every athlete was different. Right. And he had some girls who could hit for three hours, and Cindy and I were like, we just crushed the ball for an hour. I don't need to hit another hour. Like, that was good work. I was focused. I like, I, I wasn't it. joking around. Uh -huh. I was locked in. Like, we're done. And I was, I was like that at Michigan. I would get in to hit. I would take three swings off front toss. And I'd say I'm ready for the game. Yeah. And Hutch would always be like, what the heck? Then but then as long as – Some days it right? could yeah. be longer. I was just – There were days, yeah, I would hit. And then it's like I had to let the rest of the lineup get through. And then I'd get back in because I'm yeah. like, that did not feel good. Right. I need more swings before the game. Like I would – or I would – you know, we always had a bunting station. Like I'd be like, hey, I'm not bunting. I need to go swing. Like I need to 
this mm -hmm. didn't feel right. Let me let me get this right before the game. But there's days where I, I've literally stepped in. Off, I remember Biggie would be throwing a front toss. First pitch, I nuke. I'm like, done. Done, yeah. I'm like, let's go play. Like, I'm ready. Like, it's just like you know you as do. a hitter. You mm -hmm. just figure that out. And I feel like the consistency is part of it because, yep. I mean, I didn't hit my home runs just by accident. Like, right. I was consistently using my legs, consistently trying to create backspin. Like, I'm not a big girl. Yeah. I had to figure it out. So on the podcast, you told us that you were struggling, right, at the beginning of the season. Mm -hmm. So what was the reason you were able to surpass that mental hurdle? Like, what were things that you were doing? Keep in mind, though, she was struggling and then still got SEC Player of the Year. So, like, yeah. there had there was, like, a significant jump. That's what like, I'm that's saying. That's what's crazy. So like, what was the mental flip for you? Forget everything physical, whatever it may be. How did you overcome that mentally? Because a lot of girls – you know, may start off facing adversity. And yeah. Like, oh, my God, this season. Just basically almost scratched the season the first couple weekends mm -hmm. in. I've seen it before. Yep. So, like, what what was the mental change that you made where you were able to flip it on and be like, all right, let's turn it on now? I think you just really have to trust the process. Um, it's not going to fix overnight. It's not going to be easy. But trusting the process, putting the work in and grinding it out, it's going to pay off in the long run. Um, and you just got to learn how to be tough with it. I mean, it's a game of failure. You're going to fail literally seven times at least out of the ten. So you just have to be prepared for that, learn how to deal with that, grow with it, and then just trust the process and continue to put the work in. I mean, I, nothing changed. Nothing in my swing changed. Maybe it was just like a mindset of staying more middle, you know, that clicked it or my hand syncing up. But it was still the same work I was putting in in the beginning of the season to the end. I feel I like doing. I messaged you about something because I said something about your swing. It was like when you were still in season, I'm like, dude, you look like you're seeing beach balls. Mm -hmm. And you were like, yeah, you said something like I just, it was something with your hands. Like mm -hmm. it was like a quick little adjustment, nothing yep. crazy. But I think what's important to note is like her adjustment, just like any other athlete that, you know, can hit adjustments going to be small. It's usually right. never big. Like it's not, it's not some like crazy mind blowing thing. Yeah. Usually they're, you're trying to ride the wave with your swing. Yep. You're like, my swing feels like crap, but I need to keep it the same because it's like, it got you there. It's not just all of a sudden a bad swing. Right. Like you don't just wash up your swing and say, here, let me create a new one. Yeah. So instead it's like, let's go through the suck and just like, let's, I guess, suck at softball for a couple yep. of days until it just falls through. And usually what's funny is like the hit you get is probably a terrible hit mm -hmm. that like breaks it all up. Like it's just like a little, little ugly blooper. blooper. That's what I, yeah. It's yeah. always an ugly blooper, an ugly rollover, yeah. like swinging bunt. And then you're like, now you're on a rampage hey, of going, you know, five I'm, for five. I mean, the only difference I can think of from the South Carolina weekend to Georgia weekend, I mean, it's not even anything with my swing. It was literally just thinking about keeping my hands on this chalk line and driving my hip through center field. Mm -hmm. that my back hit through center. I mean that's it it wasn't anything it like, I wasn't changing my it. stance I wasn't doing anything with my bat like it was literally just drive my hands up the middle but it's crazy because it all starts mentally yep. right it all starts you recognizing mm -hmm. that and mentally creating a plan yes because you like before you physically do it you have to think you about to doing think about it, it. Yeah. so it's then it's like think about it but then like I always tell people they're like well how do I get out of a slump how do I get out of like you have to keep swinging yeah even if it doesn't look pretty and you're rolling over it and your butt you out and going. it's you just swing yep. and it's gonna look terrible sometimes but like that's the best thing that you could do is mm -hmm. to swing yourself out of it um a really good hitter who's great at hitting like it's funny because she always jokes about hating the rise ball because she'll swing and miss at it is Sam Fisher in the pro league. And there's like plenty of clips of her whiffing the rise ball and striking out and being like, oh, oh. But then all of a sudden, like her swinging through that then leads to her hitting like five jacks right. on the rise ball right. because she just like embraced that suck of, wow, yeah. I'm striking out. I'm getting fooled, but I know I can hit that pitch. And she swung through it. I mean, I think if you ask any hitter, there's a lot of times they can tell you about when they failed, but mm -hmm. how it led to something good. So, yep. like, you have to just go through that, deal with it, and let it, everything happen after that. Yeah. I think it's important. That's a very vicious cycle that a girl could get into, though, mm -hmm. because now when they're in that slump, they're in that state, dealing with failure, now you get all these people coming at you probably. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, coach over here, coach so-and-so, hey, you're doing this with your hands. This coach is saying, oh, you're doing this with your hands, with your legs. Go on Instagram, you see these hitting gurus. They're like, hey, Aaron Judge does this. And you're like, shoot, I don't do that. I need to do that. So, like, just ultimately not being tone deaf yes. with your own swing is what is going to separate you from getting out of that mm -hmm. and, get, and not. You know what I mean? So that's awesome that you were able to recognize that. You were able to come up with a fix. And then now, look, you had all the success that you had this year. 
Same thing with you, not being tone deaf. Like, you know you. You know the player you are. You know, you're not going to let somebody come in here, some world-class hitting coach, tell you something different. And right. And just throw what you've known out the window. Yeah. And yeah. that goes to show, you know, for you guys, because a lot of girls would do that. You know, to completely honest. That's they why that process is so people. important. Like, because yeah. you figure out your own thing. Like, by doing it consistently, mm -hmm. you, you know what works for you. Like, you still listen. There's plenty of things I heard Hutch and whoever say that I'm like, yeah, this clicks. Or sometimes it didn't click. And I'm like, I don't think that works for me. And a good coach is going to try to, like, work with you to figure out something. They're not going to just say, this is what you're doing, and that's it. Because yeah. that's not everyone has the same swing. Not everyone's body can get into the same positions. Like literally, physically, yeah. people can't get into the same positions as somebody else. Someone might be more flexible. Someone might just be overall stronger. Like it is what it is. So it's just like knowing your swing, but also like knowing kind of when to put the ego away, the pride away, and be like, yeah, I should work on this. Or also being like, this is what works for me. Like, let's go from there. Yeah, and I think it's funny because we all have, like, a key component that we're talking about. It's, like, being in tune with our body and, like, knowing us. Like, you have put the reps in. You know your swing better than anyone. I put the reps in. I know my swing better than anyone. It's just being able to adapt but also, like, stand up if you have something like, oh, this doesn't feel right or I'm feeling this. Like, you know yourself better than anyone. So after you've put the work in, you are going to know yourself. Don't let things change and just, like, go out the window because someone else said something. Yeah, because yeah. ultimately coach ain't in the batter's box with you. Right. No. It's you up they there. Hit, yeah, they're, yeah, they're not the ones seeing the pitch that has to hit it. Yep. Um, but ultimately this all comes back to, you're saying it's it's cliche, but it's trust the process. Yeah. That's what it all comes back to. You have a safety blanket because you know how hard you worked mm -hmm. to get there. Like we have that saying on the wall, game rewards the mm -hmm. grind for a reason. Because ultimately the game will reward you if you do put in the time and effort, Absolutely. if you do put in the work. Absolutely. You know, you guys are where you're at because of that. Nothing was handed to you. You know what I'm saying? Before you, you didn't have your sister or something or your dad in the big leagues mm -hmm. just guiding you there. You know what I mean? Like, you guys had to earn everything you did, and that's the safety net you can rely on. Mm -hmm. I'd hate to be a girl in your situation that has no work ethic at all because then you're not going to come out of that no. Like no. In, a, in a poor situation. It's really hard to be mentally tough when your work ethic is not there. Yes. Because yeah. you, because then you're going to question everything. You can only lie to yourself so much. Mm -hmm. You can only, and I know that because I lied to myself during the whole knee recovery process. Like I kept thinking I was doing enough, but I was really avoiding running. Yeah. I was really avoiding agility because I was terrified I was going to re tear my knee. So instead, I'd start hitting, but I'm like, I'm in no place to be hitting right now. I should be working on agility and speed and all these things. But I was lying to myself, thinking like I was fine. But then it's like no, you actually have to do this before you can get here, right? You got to walk before you can run type of thing. So it's like you can only lie to yourself for so long as an athlete, and then it's, it's going to catch up to you. Like if you say you're doing one thing, but you're actually not, it, it, it'll be yeah. very obvious. It will know. You will know. Yeah. The game will know too. All right, that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us. You're going to notice that in today's video, there's no fluff. We give you exactly what the most elite players do. It's straight. It's to the point. It's black and white. This is what she does. This is how she is, who she is, how she gets those numbers, how she's SEC Player of the Year and one of the best all time. Make sure you follow along. Check out the subscription below for the 32 Approach Softball Academy. Game rewards the grind. It knows how much you've invested.